Well, I trust that your hearts are ready and prepared um, for the reading and preaching of God's Word. And so, with that being said, I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John chapter 5 as we look at some very interesting verses this morning. Today we're going to be going through verses 6 through 12 of 1 John chapter 5, and there has been a lot of debate as to exactly what these verses are actually saying, but I believe with the help of the Holy Spirit uh, that we will be able to extract the crux of what the Word of God wants us to understand. And so with that being said, please stand with me as you find your place in 1 John chapter 5, again as we read verses 6 through 12 together. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He testified or has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. The one who does not believe, God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Thank you. You may be seated. When studying the Bible, one of the first things that you do is observation. You make careful observation of what is in the text. And one of the things that you look for while making observation is repetition. If something is mentioned over and over in a passage then it must be of importance. And so with that in mind, it becomes obvious from our text today that the key word in these verses is testify. It's used in some form or fashion some nine times in these verses. It's a word that's derived from the Greek word martis, M-A-R-T-U-S which means remembering or testifying to something. And it's believed that because so many gave their lives for testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that martis, the Greek word martis, became the root word for the English word martyr. Moreover, martis, the Greek word, is a legal word used to describe a witness in a court of law who would provide evidence by their testimony so that the judge can render the proper verdict. Here, that is exactly why John is using this word. He calls for the testimony of three credible witnesses so that the proper verdict concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ might be rendered. In verses 1 through 5 that we saw last time together in the book of 1 John, we saw that Christians are overcomers in Jesus Christ. But with the heretics that were there in the midst of John's readers, John knew that many would question why should they believe that Jesus is who John says he is. After all, his own people rejected him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. If his own people rejected him, why should they believe who, why should they believe rather that he is who John says that he is? And not only is John communicating this 
in this epistle, 1 John, concerning Jesus, not only is he communicating Jesus as the Son of God, as being incarnate, as being the Savior of the world, he makes it clear that this is the purpose for which he has written his gospel as well. If you were to go back into the gospel of John, chapter 20, and read verse 31, you would see this, that these have been written, these what? These miracles, these writings, these things that John has recorded in his gospel. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so our faith this morning in Jesus Christ is based on valid external and internal witnesses who testify to the validity of our salvation. In other words, what's, what sets us apart from those who are placing their faith in Allah? What puts us apart, sets us apart from those who are putting their faith in any other false god what sets us apart from those who are traveling down the path and course of some other type of religion well one is that we have these witnesses who testify to the validity of our salvation the external witnesses that we will see in this text are used to bring us to faith in Christ and it is the internal witness that we will see in our passage that confirms that we truly are in Christ. And so with that being said, let's look at the three witnesses to one testimony that we find here in these verses, which is the title of today's message. Three witnesses, one testimony. The first point that I want you to see is found in verses 6 through 8. I want you to see the three witnesses themselves in keeping with what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says this, On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. John knows this. John understands this. And so as we are under this first heading, the three witnesses, John is establishing just that, three witnesses that will confirm this matter. And so John lays out for us three powerful witnesses. Look at verse 6. This is the one, capital O, pointing ahead to Christ and his uniqueness as the Son of God. Look back at verse 5. He has just said, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is what? The Son of God. And so having just said that, he now in verse 6 says, this is the one, capital O, pointing ahead, who came by water and blood. Now, when he says who came, what's he referring to? Let me just point out here that he's not talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, but he's referring to the revealing of Christ as the Messiah in his public ministry. And so, this is the one who came, who was revealed in his public ministry by water and blood, the two witnesses, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only one by which man can be saved. Now, what is this water and blood that's being mentioned here? This is where a lot of confusion has come, a lot of debate has come over the years as to what's being referred. Some would say that he's referring to the water and blood, the water that ran down Jesus' side on the cross of Calvary when pierced through with the spear and, of course, the blood that was shed. But what is being said here, what is being communicated is one, the commencement of Jesus' ministry, and second, the consummation of his ministry. What do I mean by that? Well, for water is referring to the baptism of Jesus, where the Father, God the Father, affirmed Jesus 
as his son in whom he was well pleased at the commencement of Jesus' saving ministry. What happened? On that day when Jesus came and John the Baptist was baptizing, John declared, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And as John baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It was the affirmation of Jesus being who he is, the Son of God, in the commencement of his ministry. And the blood refers to the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, which was the consummation of his saving ministry in which the Father also was well pleased. We know this from Isaiah 53. It pleased him to crush his son. John writes these things knowing that the false teachings of the Gnostics are infiltrating the church and the, the readers of this letter. You see, you've got to understand something, and this morning is not so much a shouting hallelujah message as, as it is, let's hunker down and let's figure out what John's saying. And when you understand the background of what was going on as John's readers were receiving this, you find that the Gnostics, the heretics, were teaching that Jesus was a mere man and that at the commencement of his ministry, at his baptism, the Spirit of Christ descended upon the man Jesus and the man Jesus became the Christ. And just before he was crucified, the Spirit of Christ left him because there's no way that God in flesh could die upon a cross. And so the Spirit of Christ left the man Jesus and the man Jesus died on the cross. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's one spin of heresy. Another spin of heresy that was being communicated was that Christ only appeared to be a man, but did not have a real body. He only seemed to have a real body, therefore he could not die. Do you see how that when John gives these two external historical witnesses of the baptism of Jesus and the death of Jesus, that he is with one swipe taking out these heresies that were being spread among his readers. He even goes a little further in verse 6 by saying, not with water only, but with water and with the blood. A purposeful distinction being intentionally made because of the heresy that was being spread about Christ. In other words, he wasn't just the Christ at his baptism. He was the Christ at his death. And so John says, it's the Spirit who testifies. And notice this, not testified, past tense but testifies, present tense, ongoing, the uninterrupted testimony of God in convincing human hearts of this truth concerning Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit that testifies to this. It's the Spirit of God that convinces your heart and my heart that the Jesus who was baptized and the Jesus who was crucified is the Son of God and the only one by which man can be saved. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. This is just speaking to the total reliability of the Spirit's testimony. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's testimony is grounded and inseparable from His nature. And what is the nature of the Holy Spirit? Truth. God is absolute truth. 
In him there is no lie, neither can there be any lie. God is absolute truth. And so the testimony of God is inseparably connected and grounded in the nature of God, which is truth. I made a mistake earlier. I said this isn't a hallelujah shouting message. That's good. Now, amen. Amen. My salvation, my eternity is not based upon a lie, nor one who can lie. And so when God bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God, I who am fallible, I who can, who can waver and shake and, and doubt, I go back to the testimony. And the one who gives witness on the witness stand is one who cannot lie. We do our best to keep people from lying on the witness stand by asking them to place their hand on a Bible and swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Because it's understood even by carnal man that in God there is absolute truth. So that is the testimony Verse 7 and 8, for there are three that testify, the three witnesses to Jesus being who John has proclaimed him to be. And they testify, again, present tense, they have testified, they do testify, and they will continue to testify to the truth about Jesus Christ in the proclamation of the gospel. And he tells us what those three witnesses are. He says, the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. They are in one, if you have the King James. The water and the blood are the historical, impersonal witnesses, and the Holy Spirit is the personal witness of God to the validity of the historical. In other words, the historical happened... But you weren't there. I wasn't there. And so are we just believing the testimony of mere men who can lie, who are fallible, who make mistakes even when the best intentions were intended? Are we just basing our eternity upon the mere testimony of men? No. John says the historical happened and the Spirit which is a personal witness, very present today, who was there then, testifies to the validity of the historical. It did happen as it's recorded. It is what it says it is. And what does it say? That Jesus is the Son of God, come to be the Savior of the world. If you have the King James this morning, a translation from which I preached for many years, and uh, a good translation, you'll notice that as we've read through what I've covered so far, I want to just pause here. You'll notice that there's a variance in, in reading as we've looked at what we've read. And in the King James, you'll read verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This in theology is referred to as the Johannine, Johannine comma. Why is it referred to that? Why is the rendering so different? And the reason is it's believed to be a scribal edition. What does that mean? It means that as copies of the Word of God were copied by scribes who copied every word, every dot, every tittle, that there was an addition made by those scribes to the original manuscripts. And in order to try to bring even more validity and affirmation to what John is writing, it's believe that it was pinned in there that the three, the Holy Trinity of God who are in heaven are tied to the three witnesses on earth, if you notice that terminology, in verse 8. Do you see that? Look at verse 8. If you have uh, King James, does that make sense? And so this was not in the majority of the manuscripts. What does that mean? Does that mean it's not true? No, it's absolutely true. There are three in heaven. 
And these three are one. There is a holy trinity, and it is very clear in Scripture that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Word, who is Jesus Christ, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So the Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Spirit, these three are one in heaven. That is very true. But it is not communicated in other translations because it being so rarely found in the manuscripts that we have. And so what are we to glean from all of this? As we've looked at verses 6 through 8, what is it that we're to take away? Here's the answer to that. We are to take away that there are three witnesses to the truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ. There are the external witnesses of the water and the blood, the water that testifies to the person of Christ. It testifies to the person of Christ because the Father affirmed, this is my Son. He is the Son of God. And second, the blood which testifies to the work of Jesus Christ being successfully accomplished. And so he was who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah. And so therefore his death is an efficacious death. It is effective. It does accomplish. It is a definite atonement because Jesus, God, Emmanuel, with us, was the one who was sinless, who took our sin upon himself, upon that cross, and therefore his death means something. Those are the external witnesses. And third, there is the internal witness of the Spirit as he opens the eyes, opens the ears, and ultimately opens the hearts of man to the reality of this glorious truth, persuading us to repentance and saving faith. Some of you here this morning, you've been raised in your church all your life. You don't doubt anything that's been said so far. As far as Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus dying upon a cross, but that's all here, but you've never been persuaded to repentance and saving faith. The external, historical witnesses of some 2,000 years ago are fixed in your mind as a reality, but they have never become an internal reality in your heart by the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> Number two, verse 9, I want you to see the trustworthiness of the witnesses. In verse 9, John tells us that these witnesses are trustworthy because they are ultimately God's witnesses. Look at verse 9. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater What's John doing? John's simply arguing from the lesser to the greater. If we will accept as trustworthy the testimony of fallible men, men who can make mistakes, men who sometimes have ulterior motives, how much more should we accept the testimony of an infallible God whose testimony, the Bible says in verse 9, is greater? Why is it greater? It's greater because of its origin being in God himself, and it's greater because of its content, because its content is of greater value and, in, and eternal importance. You with me? If you're going to trust the witness of a man who's going to stand up and testify about whether your neighbor stole your lawnmower or not, something that's temporal, something that's of lesser importance, how much more should you believe and accept the testimony of God who has greater testimony because it's from God himself and because it's way more important than a lawnmower. It's way more important than money. It has to do with your soul. It has to do with where you will spend eternity as to whether or not you are truly reconciled with God or not. John explains further. For the testimony of God, who cannot lie, is this that he has testified concerning his son. If Jesus was not who he said he was, 
and who John has written concerning him, then the Father would have never testified of the Son. How did he testify to the Son? Here's something you can jot down. There were the audible testimonies. The Father spoke audibly at his baptism, at his transfiguration, his baptism in Matthew 3, his transfiguration in Mark chapter 9, and even during the Passion Week in John chapter 12. There were also the nonverbal miraculous testimony at Jesus' death and resurrection. And so the testimony is trustworthy because it's God's testimony. Third and finally this morning, I want you to see in verses 10 through 12, the totality of the testimony. In verse 11, John tells us what the testimony of the three witnesses are. And in verses 10 and 12, he tells his readers the conclusion of it all as it relates to each individual. What is the testimony? If you'll skip verse 10 and look at verse 11, let's, let's determine what the testimony is. The testimony is this, verse 11 that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. This is what God testifies to be true. Now, I want you to understand something. All of these are important distinctions. You can be a shallow, infant Christian all your life if you want to be, but know this, one, that's an absolute disobedience to God, who has called you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And know this also, secondly, that it's to your own detriment, that you don't grow to the fullness of knowing and understanding all that God's done and all that God is and all that God would have for you to enjoy. And so it's important to learn these distinctions. We could have just read through these verses and in five or ten minutes got the shallow meat of it. Let me rephrase that. The shallow milk of it. But we don't want just the shallow milk of it. We want the deep meat of it. And so what we find here is when we look at this, that eternal life is not talking about mere eternal existence. Are you listening? Eternal life, the key word there is life. Every one of you, myself included, every individual who is born will spend eternity somewhere. Amen. And let me narrow that down for you. In heaven or in hell, for there is no purgatory. So every soul will exist for eternity. And so when we are saved by the grace of God and given eternal life, it's not that we will now exist for, forever. It's the quality of how we will exist forever. And the quality of the life that we will experience is found in His Son. You see that? This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life. He doesn't say eternal again because the emphasis is the quality of the life that we have in Jesus Christ. That's why if you don't love Jesus, if you don't get excited about Jesus, you better question whether you're saved or not. Because if all you have is fire insurance for walking an aisle, saying a prayer, and getting wet in a baptistry, you don't have much. There's a love for Jesus because that eternal life is rooted and grounded and inseparably connected to Jesus himself. Jesus said in his high priest, high priest prayer in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Which is what every true follower of Jesus will fully enjoy in the unending glory and joy of heaven. Unending joy and glory in Christ in heaven. And you can't take out in his son from verse 11 
Because that prepositional phrase is what narrows down the truth of how one has eternal life. You don't have eternal life in, through church. You don't have eternal life through good deeds. You don't have eternal life through anything except exclusively in His Son. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except by him. For there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. And so we see the testimony. What is, in closing then, the summary of it all as it relates to each and every person in here this morning? The answer is how each person responds to the testimony of God concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ is what determines your eternal destiny. As we look at verse 10 and 12, you will see the Word of God making it explicitly clear where every one of us stands. You fall in one of these two categories. Let's look at it. Verse 10, the one who believes, the one who has the saving response of faith in Jesus Christ with ongoing active faith in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. In other words, if you're a true believer and you possess eternal life now and always, then you enjoy an inner reality of this glorious truth. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. This is the experiential aspect of your salvation. If you don't have that, I don't care how many names, how many church roles your name's on. Because he that has not the Spirit of Christ is none of his. This is important, folks. Because unfortunately, we've had too many preachers stand in too many pulpits saying, if you'll just repeat this prayer, if you'll just come, look, if you're too shy, just wink at me. Now, you don't even have to come down, just, just wink at me. Just give me some sign. It, you know, wipe your forehead, do something. Let's get you in the back door of heaven. There is no back door. And so if you don't have the internal witness in yourself, and you're none of his. Believes in the Son of God. I can't pass this up. I want you to know that more literally it, it could be said this way, believing into the Son. Why is that important? Believing into the Son. Not just believing in the Son, some mental ascent, but believing into the Son. It has to do with the union with Christ that one receives when they are saved. Christ in you and you in Christ, permanently, eternally positioned in Him in salvation. But verse 10, the one who does not believe. You haven't believed, you continue not to believe. The Bible says God's made you a liar. And this is the proper verdict. Why is it the proper verdict? Why are you a liar? He tells us why. Because that individual has not believed in the testimony that God, that God has given concerning him son, his son. The unbeliever's rejection to Christ is also an attack on the character of God. If you're not saved this morning, would you please hear me right now? If you've tuned me out the entire time, please hear this. You putting off salvation and not repenting and believing the very moment you understand this truth is the same as you saying, God, you're a liar. Because if what God said is true, then we ought to immediately, without hesitation, fall on our knees in repentance and beg God for salvation in Jesus Christ. He's, he who has not believed does not believe. God says he's a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. I like what one person said, quote, Stott, 
said, Unbelief is not a misfortune to be pitied. It is a sin to be deplored. Its sinfulness lies in the fact that it contradicts the word of the one true God and attributes falsehood to God. In other words, it says, if you're calling God a liar. For those of us who are saved, this is why we must not cuddle and comfort those who are in their sin. They're not to be pitied. They're to be confronted. Because to live in sin is to call God a liar. Because he has testified this to his son. Last verse. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. You can't get more clear than that, can you? If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus Christ and all that comes with having Jesus has been communicated in our text and in everything else we've looked at in this letter so far, then you do not have the life. This morning, for those of us who are saved, our foundation is solid. The witnesses have taken the witness stand and given evidence to the validity of the testimony, and the verdict is in. Jesus is the Son of God. And being the Son of God, having died upon Calvary's cross and borne our sin, He is the Savior of the world, the Savior of every individual who will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our foundation is solid, and there is no other foundation than can be laid than that which is laid, Christ Jesus the Lord. And so on the solid rock I stand, all else is shifting sand. But this morning, if you're not saved, I want to read to you some verses from Hebrews, and then we will pray. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Do you realize that neglect is also reject? How many of you ever, you didn't, you didn't want your license to expire. You just neglected to take the time to take notice of when the expiration date was. You didn't reject your license and say, I don't want it anymore. You just neglected it. Some of you this morning are the same way, but how will you escape the judgment of God if you neglect so great a salvation? If you keep saying some other time, some other day, not today, I want to live in my sin a little longer. I want to live it up. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm not ready to give my life to Jesus Christ yet. In neglecting salvation, you are rejecting salvation And so these final verses, Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. If you're not saved this morning and hearing that from the Word of God doesn't cause you to repent and believe and be saved, then you are actively living in rebellion to God and saying, I don't believe a word you've said. God, you are a liar and you are a fake. That's where you stand with God. 
And that's why you're referred to in the Word of God as an enemy of God. That's why His righteous wrath will consume those who die without Christ. Because He's testified to the truth. And you've ignored the testimony. Will you be saved today? Will you trust Christ? Will you become a believer and follower of the Lord Jesus? Or will you remain in your sin? And for us who are saved, praise God for such a sure, rock-solid testimony. Let's pray.